This is bigger than me. This is bigger than you. This is about our legacy. We're starting to talk about legacy again. Like when when is the last time that mainstream media was talking about legacy for our kids? They they don't. They they never ever talk about how how are we leaving the world and our children in a better position than when we found it? I, I think our generation is looking at this going, no, we're going to make sure the kids are okay. We're going to make sure that they're extremely well-funded and extremely well-armed and dangerous as hell, but extremely peaceful people who want to build, not destroy, but build something that will be, you know, I don't say everlasting, but it's going to last for, you know, 2,000 years, hopefully. Greetings and salutations, my fellow plebs. My name is Walker, and this is the Bitcoin Podcast. The Bitcoin time chain is 846542, and the value of one Bitcoin is still one Bitcoin. Today's episode is Bitcoin Talk, where I talk with my guest about Bitcoin and whatever else comes up. Today, that guest is Shane Hazel. Shane is a Bitcoiner, a veteran, and he's also run for Congress, Senate, and Governor of Georgia. We talked about quite a range of topics from homeschooling and the impact of public education or indoctrination on society, to his military service, to the current political landscape, to CBDCs, and even got into psychedelics. Shane is a great guy, and I enjoyed the heck out of this conversation. I think you will too. Before we dive in, do me a favor and subscribe to The Bitcoin Podcast wherever you're listening, and give this show a five-star rating. Or don't, Bitcoin doesn't care, but I sure would appreciate it. Also, just a heads up that you can find links in the show notes to get discounts on the Bitcoin-only Bitbox O2 hardware wallet from Bitbox Swiss, and on 5G SIM card service from Cloaked Wireless that protects you from SIM swap attacks. The promo code is WALKER, W-A-L-K-E-R, for both. If you'd rather watch this show than listen, head to the show notes for links to watch on YouTube, Rumble, and now on Noster via Highlighter. But if you're like me and you prefer to just listen to your podcasts, I highly recommend you check out Fountain.fm. Not only can you send Bitcoin to your favorite podcasters, but you can earn Bitcoin just for listening to this fucking podcast. And if you are already listening to The Bitcoin Podcast on Fountain, consider giving this show a boost or creating a clip of something you found interesting. Finally, if you are a Bitcoin-only company interested in sponsoring another fucking Bitcoin podcast, hit me up on social media or through the website bitcoinpodcast.net. Without further ado, let's get into this Bitcoin talk with Shane Hazel. can't say if I'm uh, I can classify myself as a professional yet at at uh, at this this whole podcasting game. I'm I'm still a little wet behind the ears but you doing, got a, doing my you, best. You, you've got your neon lights behind you. I mean that's it's about as professional as it gets, my man. Well, I know. I was like, okay, how do I really step up the professionalism? Let me uh let me order some some Chinese neon from Amazon and <laughs> Everyone will have to take me seriously after that, you know. So yeah, I'm I'm glad it shines through, uh, and it did not cost me too much. So thank you, cheap labor over there in China. Really appreciate it. I know it's gonna be sad when that runs out, isn't it? It is, and I have. To, I, I, it, I say it, that tongue in cheek. <laughs> no, I know, but it, it also like. I think people there's all, always talk of like reshoring, you know, manufacturing back to America. Mm -hmm. But I really have to wonder if we're so far gone at this point, like we've gotten so addicted to cheap, you know, everything is orderable on Amazon for next to nothing. And we don't know who makes it. It's made somewhere that's not America and it's all dirt cheap. And it's like any time we have to pay a decent price for something that's like well-made in America, people balk at it and they say they want to buy American but then they see the price tag and they're like, huh, well, I don't know about that. And so I, I just have to wonder if the, the, the shock that would come with a legitimate large scale reshoring of manufacturing would just be too much for most to handle. Like then you would actually see the inflation, like, like oh, the yeah. real inflation. It would be out of control. 
I, I don't know. I mean, do you think that's it? like every politician uh, uh, talks uh, about that? A every short politician far for 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 manufacturing. You know, it's funny. Is there's there's just mass migration right now. You know, and you, and I get to see it every day over at Swan, where people are trying to find safe ground for their assets, right? And as they're trying to find safe ground, I see what's going on with the banks. The banks are doing these incredibly, um, you know, underhanded, you know, if, if not just straight out, you know, lies and manipulation to hold on to capital for as long as yeah. they can. So as, as we make this adjustment and we, we, we move that on that continuum, I think, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, like Galt's Gulch, you know, if, if you're looking for the people who are the doers, the movers and the shakers, like this Bitcoin community is obviously that personified. And as that gains traction, and as you have more and more people in Bitcoin reinvest those billions and millions that they are, you know, are, are worth now, uh, at least in Bitcoin into the Bitcoin ecosphere, I think those jobs and starting from scratch, I mean, you're already seeing it. And I mean, me and my family, we practice it. You start to see this, the can do's that will do out there that will go out and farm. They'll homestead, they'll homeschool. They, they are, they are doing what they need to do to be independent because independence is a verb. And as you see those people begin to lift their own station in life again. I think that's contagious. I think courage is contagious, which is what it takes. I think hard work is contagious. And I think there's a lot of people out there that are yearning for a hard day's work and the proper value of that hard day's work to see the benefits of it from in their own life and the independence that stems from being maybe an entrepreneur or own, you know, having your own farm or homestead or, you know, what you're producing out of your own kids in terms of homeschool. And I, so is it going to take a lot of hard work and is there going to be a lot of, um, you know, I, I hate to use the word die off, but there's going to be people that are like, they're not going to make it. There are people that, you know, the, that won't put up the effort that won't you know use the god-given abilities that they have and unfortunately in i think in the new world here it's those people are not long but the people that want to buckle down and want to you know go out and earn it i think they're going to have more opportunity now that we're going to start putting rungs back in those economic ladders that we haven't seen in a very long time i i definitely agree with that and and it gives me like seeing Bitcoiners always gives me hope. Um, and, you know, you mentioned homeschooling. And I did want to pick your brain about that a little bit. I'm a, I'm a new dad sure. here, uh, you know, five months in. And I was, uh, I was actually, uh, I've talked about this a little bit, but I was homeschooled myself. Uh, and the older I get, the more grateful I am to my parents for doing that. I did it uh, from, you know, whenever you were, I don't even know when you were supposed to start public school like they now they do like pre-k and all this this shit because apparently you need a teacher to get, tell you how to read your abcs i don't know i never did any of that i wasn't until high school where i i came to my parents and i said because I, I did sports my whole life was so i wasn't like some everybody thinks of homeschoolers as like these weird sheltered you know freaks basically uh which certainly i knew some of in my homeschooling community but that, that's i'm raising three of them right now yeah but but like it, most like you know people homeschool for different reasons um people's you know parents have different quirks and every kid has their own quirks right but i i did sports my whole life had a you know great social life both within kind of the homeschooling community of families but then also just with all my friends who went to public school and you know did boy scouts and all that kind of stuff too and uh i I reached a certain point where I wondered, like, my friends would always tell me, like, about all, like, the homework they were doing, all the all the work. And I, and I was genuinely thinking to myself, I was like, fuck, what if I'm, like, what if I'm an idiot? Like, what if my parents have not done a very good job? What if I haven't done a very good job? And what if I'm actually really far behind? So I told my parents, I was like, you know, mom, dad, I, I, I want to try out, you know, public school for high school. Mm -hmm. Let me try this out just because I I need to. I need a way to benchmark myself and I need to know if I'm like, I just want to know if I'm an idiot basically. Like, and that was a good and bad uh, choice to go to high school. I realized I was not in fact an idiot. Um, I realized that public school was in fact stupidly easy, uh, that it took up so such an inordinate amount of time. Whereas I used to get all of my work done. Like I would read my Saxon math textbooks myself, like just cover to cover doing every problem. 
remember getting into public school and, and it's like, we, we only have to do like every other problem and we skip like three chapters before we're doing a new one. And like, we're not actually learning everything in this textbook. Like, what is this? But I realized how incredibly inefficient public school was. And I, I graduated high school valedictorian because it was a, uh, like, <laughs> it, was that so easy. It, it, it was really fucking easy. Um, and I, I, I was grateful. I had some actually really incredible teachers um, who to this day, like I'm very grateful for my chemistry teacher uh, and, and my calculus teacher to come to mind. Those were two standout guys that did a, a, a wonderful job, but <laughs> overall it was like, holy shit, this is mostly just a waste of time. And we're teaching yeah. to the lowest common denominator and trying, you know, that was kind of back in like the no child left behind era too. And so Carl and I look forward to homeschooling uh, our son and any future kids that we have. But I'm curious, what's your experience been with it? Um, and, uh, you know, from a from someone who was homeschooled, I can I can at least say from my perspective, I think you're making the right choice. But, <laughs> I, you know, do you uh, do you guys have like a community of, of other families like involved in any sort of like homeschool collaborative charter school? How does that look for you guys? Because I think it's, it's making a huge surge right now as yeah. people realize the state doesn't know what they're doing and really doesn't have the best interests of your kids at heart. Yeah. To, to your point, I mean, the, the statistics on this, um, if you're worried about this, I think we've gone from somewhere around 250,000 families in the eighties. Now we're at, uh, 5 million, um, which, wow. you know, if, if you're looking and I, I think that, I think that's a low number. I think that was the number probably closer to 2021. And since then, you know, obviously adoption for homeschooling has gone through the roof because people have figured out absolutely just how dire the situation is for, you know, their, their, for their, their children. I mean, um, we could go through a whole host of things that obviously I disagree with, with what they teach. I mean, I fight property taxes almost every year because, uh, you know, they're, they're taking my money and throwing it towards this government indoctrination system that they've got. But, um, yeah, the, the, you know, if that, those 5 million families, if they're homeschoolers are probably larger families, right? They're, they're probably, you know, four or five, maybe six. So you could probably do conservative math around 20 million plus Americans are involved in homeschooling now. And that's, that's an incredible number. Um, now, to, uh, you know, in, in terms of our family, you know, we've got three, you know, we've got, uh, almost 13, uh, 11 and 10 year old. And, you know, we started, my, my wife is a, uh, is a classically tr trained teacher to begin with. So when the idea for us to do this, you know, came about it, th the biggest thing for us was kind of going down to the insecurity of one income. And that, I think that was the scariest thing. Um, if that's you guys, if, if that's anybody who's listening right now, don't be scared of that. Um, honestly, it frees you up, especially if it's going to be the man that goes out and does this. Um, to really pour yourself into work. And I hope you love your work. If you can find something that you love, this is going to really help. But you have more time and pressure in, in a good way to make things happen. So um, that, that's the first thing I'd say. You know, Don't worry about it so much. Just go find something that you love and then pour yourself into it. The, you know, the second thing I'd say is now that we're probably close to 10 years in uh, to homeschooling, uh, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. We live in a pretty remote location out here in North Georgia. So uh, in, in terms of the, the the social interaction on a daily basis, in terms of school, there's not so much of that. But, you know, with three kids that are very close in age, th there's a bond that they have. And then, you know, every day they go into jujitsu. So finding whatever that avenue is that you can for socialization um, and, you know, to, to maximize that with their, with their peers, uh, you, it, from every age group, you, you start to see something kind of magical happen. Uh, and you, you're, I mean, you're a product of homeschool. So you're, you, you guys are very much the, the guinea pigs to show everybody, well, listen, you know, the world isn't set up by age classifications, right? It, it's not, it, nope. you are going to interact with superiors. You're going to interact with inferiors. You're going to you sometimes be the middleman, the high, you know, the, the high or low, whatever that is. And to be able to function comfortably in those environments, you know, depending on where you find yourself at any time of any day, I think that is a, you know, one of the, the greatest things that we don't artificially create environments for these, for these kids. Right. Um, I think the other thing is, is now that you have control over curriculum, 
and you have control over their day, uh, one of the, the greatest things that you accomplish is time management. And time management is, you know, hey, you've got a certain amount of school that we need to get done. There is then going to be chores. And if you're homesteading, you know, kids are learning about, you know, animal husbandry. They're learning about gardening. They're learning about things that are going to help them stay independent. And God forbid, you know, the power goes out for any stretch of time, you know, be self-sufficient and be taken care of in, in those ways. So after that, you know, then you start to work on passion. And this is where I really lean into uh, this author that died a few years back. His name is John Taylor Gatto. And he was an amazing guy. He's, he's written a number of books, and I would highly suggest reading all of them to, uh, to any of your listeners if you're, if you're interested in this track. And it, it'll, it'll show you, you know, first and foremost, that school or indoctrination was brought over from Prussia in the 1700s under the progressive movement so that we could create good little factory workers and a homogenous culture that could be moved in any industrial direction and in any direction for combat and you know obviously you, you look at where we are i i unfortunately found him when i was overseas in fallujah after the battle of 2004 and it opened my eyes like while well, I was in theater, but the, he talks about the passion of each and every individual kid being absolutely ignored. Um, they, you know, in, in public school, they teach you to sit down, shut up, regurgitate, you know, and, and be popular and, and, and those kind of things. Whereas, you know, in, in, in a homeschool environment, if you can tap into your child's passion, figure out what they're passionate about, provide them resources, and then provide them time and talk, talk to them about how you could literally monetize your passion in life. Be a master by the time you're ready to be an 18 year old, or, you know, or at least an adult, you, you have the 10,000 reps or the 10,000 hours underneath your belt to go into the workforce, or maybe even go into the workforce before you even leave home with a giant nest egg. You, you're unleashing something that the world needs desperately right now. You, you, the world needs passionate people who have the 10,000 hours, the 10,000 reps that are masters or geniuses. And John Taylor Gatto contends that the, you know, that genius is as common as dirt. We just don't do anything to really, uh, f to foster the passion of children. And so that's, an, you know, one of the, the greatest gifts is being able to give your kids the time to study and work on their passion while they're young enough to do it. And they don't have all these, you know, external forces pushing on them, you know, and, and, and trying to get them to think about what's cool or what's not cool or to be part of the crowd and all. Hey, man, do whatever makes you happy in life. I mean, I think that's what, you know, most parents, if they're, they're honest, what do you want your kids to be? You want your kids to be happy. Let them let them pursue their passion. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, school, yeah, it concerns the the homeschool path is not only been the right path for us, but I think it's going to be the right path for helping to rebuild society after the empire collapses. If you want to be prepared for when Rome 2.0 inevitably crashes and burns, you need to keep your Bitcoin safe for the long haul. So, head to Bitbox Swiss slash walker and use the promo code walker for five percent off the fully open source bitcoin only bitbox o2 hardware wallet then go ahead and get your bitcoin off the exchange and into your own custody the bitbox o2 is easy as hell to use whether you are brand new to bitcoin and it's your first hardware wallet or you are a seasoned psychopath it's bitcoin only and again it is fully open source you can head to their github and verify that for yourself Please do not feel the need to trust me. When you go to bitbox.swiss slash walker and use promo code walker, not only do you get 5% off, but you also help support this fucking podcast. So thank you. Yeah, I hear here, first of all. Uh, and, you know, something you said that I think is so important is just the way that public school is structured. When you think about it, it's like it is just training you to be a drone it is time-based metrics versus deliverables based metrics it is you know are you it's getting you ready for that workforce where you're going to spend eight hours at that desk in that cubicle and you know what you do in those eight hours well you know stretch out your work as long as you can because you're going to be you're going to have to be here all day so who cares how long it takes you don't have to get it done right now they're just going to give you more work and that 
is such a ludicrous way, and you can see this. The pro- people who are the like a lot of people made it out. Obviously, tons of people have made it out of public school, and they're fine, and they are very deliverables based people, and they're incredibly driven. Like it has not snuffed the light. If that were the case, you know, uh, you know, we'd only have a, a few million people that were mildly functional, and maybe we do. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> who knows? But, yeah, I mean, look at Bitcoin, know, right? Yeah, right. But th- that idea that you should have a deliverables based approach to learning because life is deliverables based. Nobody cares how long it takes you to do something. They care if you got it done. And in fact, the faster you get it done, the better you having to spend 90 minutes in a classroom. Even if you finished all of your work in the first, you know, 15 minutes, that's insane. And that's just creating a mentality of "Ah, don't push yourself too hard because you're not going to get rewarded for finishing early. You're just going to be, you know, sitting there. And it's such a sad, sad reality that that is when you look at it as part of that kind of corporate machine funnel or, you know, to to your point, either industrial machine, military machine, not so much industrial in the U.S. right now anymore, but more of that corporate uh, work in that corporate box. It's just it's sad. And I think it's very heartening, though, that we see more and more families starting to say, you know what, maybe there's a different way. And now the beauty of the Internet like this. All of these tools that are available now, like I'm sure my mom would have loved to have the ability to tap into all of the YouTube curriculum that's out there. Like you can learn just about anything you want from 50 different people all across the world on YouTube alone. That's incredible. And there's so much that has been done to just modernize these curriculums, to make them more accessible to people. Like you have all the tools at your disposal. Like, you know, it's it makes it lowers that barrier to entry. I think for people who would otherwise have thought, how am I possibly going to be able to do this? And I think that's a very good thing. And to your, and to your point, this is something that's going to change the fabric of well, certainly America and other countries in the world where we're seeing a huge uptick. I saw the UK as well had their biggest spike in homeschooling since uh, the beginning of the pandemic, which is like great. I saw that just yesterday. It's great news. More of that, please. (laughs) Yeah, and, 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 and you know, the, the cost benefit to the average person out there. You know, the average person, at least here in, in the U.S., is is absolutely paying through the nose for property taxes, which are always going up because they're being artificially, you know, in, increased by all of these ridiculous, I don't know, like Black Rocks coming in, buying up swaths of property at premium so that they can continue to drive the price up. Meanwhile... You know, you've got these failing edu- or indoctrination systems. Be very careful with my language on this, because if you look at what it costs for education, like you said, YouTube is you know damn near the price of whatever you pay for internet, and you can learn anything you want. Education is practically free. Meanwhile, you know you've got billions and billions and hundreds of billions of dollars at this point that have been you know poured into an indoctrination system. Indoctrination is extremely expensive, and it's 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 just a, a cancer that. You know, society obviously should have cut out a long, long time ago, but the convenience of being able to send your kids away to this idea that you're going to, you know, discount the mom. And this is, this is, I'll tell you, in terms of, you know, a a conservative family type of idea, right? One of the, one of the hallmarks that we love here is, you know, families are insurance. Families are like, especially if you have a group of people that genuinely know how to communicate with each other. They may not see eye to eye, but at least, Hey, we're family. We're going to cover for each other. I have my brother less than a mile away. I have my mom and dad less than a mile away. I have my uh, mother and father-in-law who, you know, live with us and to have that built in network of family and to start creating these, you know, this, this healing type of, you know, layered family unit where it used to be where you just had the mom and dad and and the kids, hopefully, you know, to expand that into grandparents and aunt uncles and cousins and things like that around the, that area, that is a absolute, you know, game changer in terms of a societal, you know, you know, societal fabric. And I don't know, I, we, we, we suffered something a couple of years ago where I, you know, I was in the hospital for a while and, you know, having those people around, I, I mean, on a homestead to make things work while I was down for a little bit, unbelievably, um, you know, grateful for those kind of things. Whereas some people would look at them as a, you know, kind of a burden. It's, it's not, it's a, it's a gift. It's how you create, it's how you communicate with those people 
you know, through love and understanding, giving people the benefit of the doubt that makes all of that work. But yeah, this, um, this, this move towards a more independent education system, boy, what a, you know, and I can't wait to see what it springs from. And it's, it's not going to just be homeschool. There's going to be co-ops going on, but I, I was kind of going to the point of discounting motherhood you know, in being a homemaker, the, one of the most amazing people I have ever met my wife, like just bar none, her ability to, you know, guide three, you know, children through their day, you know, at the end of this, you know, we're going to have proof of work, whether it's, you know, you know, good or bad, it's going to be on us. Um, to get to discount that to where, you know, they did in the, you know, late forties and then on to say that, the you know, women need to go into the workplace to help earn the living because we've discounted, you know, the dollar to the point where now we're just printing it out of thin air. That idea that you're, you're going to trade those moments with your kids as a mom that you're never going to get back ever. You, you can never, ever, ever get that time back. And there's nobody else on earth that will love and comfort and instruct and just absolutely take care of, of your kids like a mom and they, they you think oh yeah okay great six figure job out there you know that that's that's better than spending time with your kids that's a better investment of your time that's a you know your ROI is it's it, it was such a lie that was told to everybody that you know was going to go to college for a you know a women's study class and underwater basket weaving or you know feminist studies you know that they're still paying back to the tune of six figures now on, on top of their six figure job where they never get to see their kids or participate in their lives or know what's going on or have their kids come to them with their problems. Instead of that, you know, you look at, you know, what we've been able to do here. And I, I think a lot of homeschooling, you know, organizations have, uh, you have not only lifelong bonds, but you have such a long storied history in interactions and memories and experiences that are so priceless that can could never be bought with that six figure salary and the ridiculous education that you got. And I, I just think it's, you know, if, if more people saw this, they'd be, you know, they'd be fleeing their nine to five or corporate jobs and in, into, you know, a homesteading life. And it's a lot of work, but it's a lot more rewarding work. Yeah. Amen. And, you know, I think that honestly, a lot of people may start to realize as the cost of uh, external childcare gets so much higher and higher and higher smart people will start to realize that hold on i'm you know i'm working even if i'm working this you know six figure job away from the home away from kids uh first of all you know 40 percent of that plus is getting taxed away j just on state you know state and federal income taxes like that so that's already gone um and then the amount that i need to pay for child care for one kid or two kid or th three kids well, that's eating up basically almost all the rest of that. So if I'm basically going to be working, I'm just working so that I can spend not time with my kids. Well, that doesn't really yeah. make any sense, does it? So it's like people may get smart by force here rather than choice. And maybe like they kind of make that calculus like, oh, wait a minute. You know, I'm, I'm paying more in childcare than I make. So that doesn't really make much sense now, does it? And so we'll, we'll see. I think that's going to be a bit of a forcing function as well. Just outside of people independently coming to this realization is people coming to the realization that, oh, well, this just economically doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, one of us may as well stay home and be with our kids more. And like, what a beautiful thing. You're going to love that. Your kids are going to love that. And they're going to grow up to be ultimately better people because of it. Like, we all know that like, no, <laughs> to your point from earlier, no bureaucrat, uh, no matter how great their intentions, no, no teacher, even a really great teacher, they cannot possibly give the love and attention to your kids that a mom and a dad can, that they yeah. cannot do it. It's, it's just not possible. First of all, because they've got 30 other kids at a minimum. So you're already spreading attention. And second of all, because they're not your blood, like, yeah. you, you know, you don't have to be a genius to figure that out. Like it's just, they may be the best teacher in the world. But even if they are, they're not going to do as good a job as you. And most of them are not the best teachers in the world. So there you go. And I think another huge issue with the American educational system in general is just the bureaucratic bloat. Like the reason it costs so much is because all of that middle management, all of those extra counselors and admin people, and this is the same with our government across the board. It's all that middle, that middle 
just bloating out and sucking mm-hmm. so much of the productive capacity of other people in with them just to support basically these useless functions that, I mean, hopefully, you know, AI will just automate most of those uh, middle bureaucrats away, but maybe that'll take a couple of years. The, the, government bureaucrat, <laughs> the government bureaucrats will be the last to let themselves get replaced by AI. You know, everyone else first. We, we always need the bureaucrats. Yeah, to, to your point, uh, we were just making copies of uh, licenses and passports earlier to get the kids' passports because they need a physical copy, a, a piece of paper with a copy of our IDs on it for each and every kid's file. And you're just like... Of course, no, they're, they'll never implement AI on their own because it will mean the death of their, and that, that will be their own undoing. Um, years ago in the Marine Corps, you know, we were having this discussion about, hey, you know, the Marine Corps has been great for a number of years for whatever, you know, their mission was, right? If, if you take away the idea that, you know, God forbid we've been part of the MIC working for the banks and the tycoons and the politicians forever. If it was just the Marine Corps, and they were doing what they were doing, they, they needed to change with the times or else they were going to be obsolete. Just, just like these politicians. These politicians, they're so obsolete, but because they have this printing, you know, th- this, this printer, they can go out there and make money out of thin air. They've ensured that, that <laughs> they continue to get paid no matter how lousy they are uh, at their job or even acting like they're trying to do their job. So, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> You, you know, uh, just because you, you mentioned your, your military service, and, and first of all, I want to thank you for your service, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, and I know a lot of people, uh, especially if you, you know, I, I am personally, uh, I'm against the, you know, I'm against war. And I think you yeah. are as well, Absolutely. and you're somebody who, who has literally served. And a lot of people think that, well, somebody who served in the military, they were, you know, they were part of this machine. And I, I always think it's important to point out that you can separate the soldier from the bureaucrats and the bankers that are pulling the strings because i mean to a man the the men that i've met that have served have been some of the most decent and genuinely caring individuals i've ever met and really give a shit about their country and about their countrymen and about their families yeah and i always think so i, I just wanted to add that little kind of disclaimer in there that i think people often blame you know the, the soldiers themselves, you had people coming back from Vietnam, people getting, you know, spat on, treated like garbage. And it's like, Hey man, they, they were, dra- first of all, they were drafted like that. that that's a, yeah. that's a whole different story. And you're, you're blaming the soldier instead of, instead of spitting on the politicians, like you should have been. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to thank you for that. But I, I also want to ask you kind of just a general question because to give folks a little bit more background for those who don't know you, who are you and how did you get here today? Because you've had quite an interesting, quite an interesting path, I think. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I guess my name's Shane Hazel. First, yeah. first, <laughs> first and foremost. Out there. Um, how did I get here? Um, well, I mean, to your point, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to stay on track and not go um, too out far, you know, outside on a tangent. Um, Tangents the, are okay. We, we kind of we kind of um, touched on this a little bit earlier, but the you know the, what you said about soldiers not being at fault. Um, I I run Bitcoin Veterans today. If you guys don't know, it's another podcast that's out there. Um, uh, we got together myself and Alex Stanzik and said, "Hey, there is a giant group of guys that is underserved in this community. Why don't we do something about that?" At any rate, um, yeah the the whole veteran thing is. One of those where we we touched on it with John Taylor Gatto um, and in this indoctrination process. If if you really look at who's running off to serve, it's a lot of the guys that you know they're overrepresented by the South, you know, the the in the United States for one thing, uh, but they're also overrepresented by working class. And when you look at when the government got their hands on these kids, you're looking at like five. So from the five till they were eighteen. Um, they were, they had their heads filled with, I pledge allegiance to the flag every morning. If they didn't do that, well, they, you did that in my time anyway, like everybody did it. Um, and then, you know, you sang all the silly songs and you watched the silly news and you watched all the star spangly nonsense and you didn't realize that they were just preparing you to pervert this really interesting idea of freedom 
sovereignty of of property and you know all the things that we talk about in austrian economics like you you were sold this bill of goods and when they actually need quote unquote need you you're not working for any of those things you know what we did overseas in iraq afghanistan syria you know the all over africa and god knows you know back in time you know throughout all the other you know century of war that we've been at you know these it was it was all the same kids that grew up that you know went off to war maybe they got drafted maybe they signed up on their own you know volition like i did because i just was like you know it was right after 9 11 six days after 9 11 i went and you know, signed up for the United States Marine Corps, got into special operations over in reconnaissance. And it was, you know, not until I fit, found John Taylor Gatto that I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm overseas, you know, for this MIC and the bureaucrats and the tycoons. And I am not doing anything for freedom and liberty and, in, in, you know, Joe back in the United States. So, I guess that's when the mask got ripped off violently and uh, you know with still four or five months on my my last tour i was just like oh boy th this is gonna be a long thing and, you know you, you just kind of revert back to hey guys let's get everybody home right like whatever we need to do to get everybody home to you know leave this place as untouched as possible you started to see that and um i started to see it especially we were stationed with a group of guys that were called oda operational detachment alpha green beret guys because we, our our platoon and especially with my team was tasked with starting to learn how we were going to uh now give our time and our efforts to socom because the marine corps was not part of socom special operations command for everybody that doesn't speak and so um we started doing this and one night when we came in very late from a mission that we had been on, I sat down, we had a, uh, a you know, a, a, a national, uh, inside of our, our small compound that was our cook. And he was just a, a normal Shiite and, you know, sat down it was like three o'clock in the morning. I said, you know, he, he's just, what do you want? And I was like, what, what do you have, man? Whatever you, whatever you want to sit down and eat. And he's like, can I join you? I said, please do. And I started talking to him and, I realized, you know, right then and there that this was just another guy from another side of the planet with a family trying to make it in the world and that everything that I had really been indoctrinated with, even by the Marine Corps, was fictitious. It was nonsense. And, you know, like, no, they don't want to go out and kill people. They're just like, yes, you know, they, they, they want to go throughout their day. They want to trade. They want to, you know, do work for, you know, a good, a good job or whatever. And then they want to go home and spend time with their family and live in peace. So I found Ron Paul after that. Ron Paul introduced me to Austrian economics in 2008, you know, went down the entire, you know, Hoppe, Austrian, um, you know, you name it, economics in one lesson to begin with. And then you get into your Rothbards and your Mises and boy, you know, the, the, the entire school of Austrian universe. And you're like, man, these guys are amazing. They're boring as hell, but they're amazing. Um, and I guess it was probably about 2015, 2016. I actually started looking into my own, uh, you know, U S representative in my district. And I was like, this guy's a piece of shit. <laughs> So I, I started having some conversations with my wife about it. And, um, you know, before we knew it, I was running for U.S. Congress in 2018. And I was running as a Republican at the time. I was a libertarian, but I was running as a Republican because I was like, you know, let's try this, you know. And I was, I was very naive. I was like, man, you know, hometown guy, war hero, all this kind of stuff, you know, is going to come in, you know, knows the Constitution, you know, by hand. Um, and we'll absolutely embarrass this guy and we'll, we'll make it, we'll, we'll make it DC and we'll start changing some shit. Well, I obviously didn't win. And, um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, obviously the, the elections down here in Georgia are, 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 are let's just say they're problematic to, to begin with. And so I went on, um, to the libertarian path, uh, ran for U S Senate in uh, 2020 and then for governor here in 2022 and you know made some made some national and international headlines for uh the 2020 thing and then you know obviously had a pretty fun debate performance over in 2022 and you know during that time i had found bitcoin i i didn't adopt it at the moment i, I was kind of dating politics and you can only have one crazy girlfriend and the block size wars were <laughs> going on right so the block size wars um kind of 
pushed me away a little bit. And then closer to 2019, 2020, I really um, had a little extra time on my hands like a lot of people did. And boy, just down the rabbit hole, in rabbit holes I went. Bitcoin just kind of you know, came up um, and started hanging out in some Bitcoin circles. And before I knew it, I was over at Swan. And uh, it's just been, you know, this this trip uh, that, you know, I, I couldn't have ever imagined and, and really uh, am, am so elated and just astonished by the crowd that I've been able to find and, and you know, be accepted into because, you know, as somebody who's run for politics, being a quote unquote a politician, I never liked that word um, because I never really identify. I never identified as politics. <laughs> um, you know, having you know to earn trust and name ID and all that fun stuff within this movement, um, I think is a really interesting and and cool thing because you know this is a meritocracy in Bitcoin, and if you're doing the right things and you know. And it is proof of work. You have to have that. And if, if you do that and you're not a scumbag, you know, over time people see that. And when people see that, it is absolutely, you know, one of the coolest, most humble, hardworking, amazing groups of people that I've ever found. Oh, you're on mute, I think. God, what a newbie go. move. Right? <laughs> but, um, no. I, I, I love the backstory. I mean, it's a, I appreciate you sharing kind of that story of revelation while, while being deployed, because I mean, I, I can imagine that was, a as about a heavy, a realization as you could have, have while you, you know, while you're literally boots on the ground yeah. a, as possible. I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible. And then to come back and to try and pursue the political side of things, you know, and I was, I rewatched, uh, the debate performance, one of the, the highlight reels that the uh, uh, Libertarian Party had put together from when you were with uh, uh, Stacey Abrams and uh, oh my, God, I'm blanking on his name. There we go, Brian Kemp. And God, He's it's just, yeah, he, he is. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's just incredible to watch that. And one of the things that stuck out to me rewatching it now prior to our chat here is just how similar the Republicans and the Democrats are. And, you know, I say this until I'm uh, blue in the face and until Carla is, you know, starts laughing at me for just repeating myself, but you know, there is no red, there's no blue, there's the state and there is you. And that, that particular debate was such a great example of that because here you've got Kemp's uh, and, and Abrams and they're both, yeah, they're Republican and Democrat, but they're both basically saying, kind of different buzzwordy versions of the same things then here's you in between them and i'll I'll link this uh this this video it's just it's a pleasure to watch and you're the only one who's actually voicing anything that is meaningfully different uh and also principled and i think that that's such an important thing every question that came up you brought it back to what your principles were and especially if there's one you didn't have a full answer to you know not you could see abrams is sitting there like reading off of her script as she's asking these things. And it's just like, it's painful to watch. And then there's you up there who's actually thinking through, well, I believe this and I believe this. And basically, you know, I don't think that you should, uh, the government should go after peaceful people. I don't think they should tax us into oblivion. I think people should be able to put whatever they want in their bodies and we should bring things as local and decentralized as possible. And, you know, it's just like, as we go into this new election cycle and there's that's the th great thing about elections there's always a new one you know every <laughs> every couple always. of years the theater just continues the best reality tv show there is and you know i'm i'm curious of your take on on the environment uh, the political landscape right now because i know you know bitcoin doesn't care um right. but you know what's that old saying like you know you may not care about politics but politics cares about you like these things do affect our lives. And I think I, I'd love to know kind of maybe a better way to frame this is, is as a starting point. So people get your perspective a little is what do you think the, the role of the modern state, the modern government is, if any, what, what do you think that that should actually be? And then maybe we can take it from there. Yeah. I, I think they think their mandate right now is totalitarianism, uh, you know, absolute control. And, and then, and here's the thing is, um, the, the, the more corrupt and crooked your government is, the more control it has to have. Just 
that that's the way it is. If they do, if they don't, then obviously then there's justice and they can't have justice because war criminals and you know pedophiles and the rest of these you know people justice is is very stiff. So I guess you know when I when I look back and and see you know a lot of what I have done in politics and involved even in, you know over that time, um, the first thing I'd say to people is. <sighs> Don't get too discouraged with 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 politics right now. Um, politics is one of those things that it, we're in a late stage empire, um, and I, I think Dave Smith was saying this when he was uh, you know arguing against Patrick Beck David. I've been saying this for a long time, and actually, I I'm probably saying this since about two thousand five, two thousand you know seven sometime. And I just told my you know I was talking to my mom and dad about it. I was like, people are too comfortable. You know, it, it, when people get uncomfortable that's when you'll see revolution. And now we're here, right? Like now people are starting to get uncomfortable. Understand that until we move into a place where Bitcoiners, specifically Bitcoiners, are reinvesting their time and effort and money and treasure into people who are also Bitcoiners that are going to run for office, you're not going to do anything in politics, especially at the national level. Um, the national level, I think, is a kind of a lost cause. And if I think if the, the Libertarian Party was smart, they would say, we won't be holding any more elections for the national level because it is a lost cause and we don't want anything to do with it, right? Um, so, you know, whether it's Trump or Biden or, you know, Kennedy or, you know, Chase Oliver for that matter. Uh, God. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for all of those, it doesn't matter. Um, nothing that any of those people can or will do will affect what happens to the empire. The empire is going to die. It's going to, it's going to crash down with the, you know, with, with the, the unpegging of the dollar and its worthlessness. And, and I've said it is as soon as an OPEC nation adopts Bitcoin, which could be very soon, you're going to see the petrodollar die a very fast death. And at that point, you know, we're, we're, what are you going to do? You're going to turn to the politicians because they're not going to save you. No, no politician is ever going to save anybody. Um, you're here, you're in it, you, your local community, uh, your local sheriff and your mayors, you know, the people in the executive positions, that's who you should probably be talking to and worrying about who they are and how they get paid because, you know, dangling carrots in front of these people who have followings with, you know, authorized legitimate you know power force and all that kind of stuff right if you're looking at these if if you're looking at anything that you can affect it's the people that you can touch so the the more decentralized the better and you can have great conversations with your sheriff i mean get go get to know him i have um and you know hey this is who i am this is what i'm about you know i'm real peaceful guy and everything i just want to be left alone for the most part i will try not to be a headache or a thorn in your side um, th you know, those kind of things, but, you know, depending on how this all goes here in the next, you know, year or so, if we get that far, um, those, those sheriffs and mayors are going to be, they're very, very important in your life. And I, I would say, you know, focus on those things, focus on building community, focus on, you know, your, your local neighborhood, um, and, and not worry about, you know, what's going on at these ridiculous levels, because until we have these politicians that are Bitcoin, I should say, let's just call them Bitcoiners. In, until we have politicians that are real Bitcoiners and understand our ethos and our values and have name, you know, uh, not only name ID, but a a real trust that they've built, you're, you're going to continue to get the same. And, and, and that's, you know, obviously not what we want. Uh, I, I kind of discovered a long time ago, unless you are, you know, going to take the votes that the fiat overlords tell you to take, or a compromise and they tell you to take, nothing changes. And, and they control the elections as well. So that that's don't be disheartened by that. This this is a the next stage in you know removing this this tyranny. Like it's it, we're gonna remove this layer of tyranny and we're going to be so much better off because like it or not, we all transact on a daily basis. And I say this all the time, you know, ninety nine point nine plus percent of the population goes around their day they don't rape, they don't murder, they don't kill, they don't coerce, they don't do any of these things. And if the part that does dies off, we're all going to be so much better. And, you know, have that nuance back in our lives at the local level to start, you know, making, 
um, real decisions with our resources that are going to, you know, do amazing things for not only you, but your community. And, you know, hopefully, you know, with Bitcoin, the ability to, to, you know, get a global economy up and running again as fast as possible. Yeah. Amen. And I think that that focus on localism versus the top level uh, is so important because I couldn't agree with you more that it really materially does not make that much of a difference who is the president at this stage that we're at right now in America. And you see this if you, you know, if you say, well, come on, you can't say that, you know, Biden isn't the worst ever and that or if you're on the other side that Trump isn't the worst ever and that uh, Obama was the best or Obama was the worst. like what really meaningfully changed you know did did we stop printing money uh, actually the money supply contracted during Biden like after expanding massively during Trump mm -hmm. like so okay you know did we did the federal government stop expanding no did we stop fighting foreign wars no not really ever um, you know, everybody holds up Obama as this like paragon of like, oh, remember the good days when, 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 which is so, whenever somebody says that to me, I'm like, oh, so you, you actually have no idea what went on, right? Like, no. You, you, you have, you have no clue. Have you seen how many, like the guy got a Nobel Peace Prize for dropping or for sending so many drones uh, over? Like, he, it, it, he literally bombed more innocent people than anybody ever in history. It's insane. Yeah, like, like it's and that's such a good filter for like, ah, OK, so you just you actually have no idea what happens. And you thought, well, wow, that's a smooth that's a smooth talking guy. I like the way he sounds. He makes me feel good about myself. Perfect. And I, I mean, he's a he was a great politician. Let's give him that like yeah. masterful politician, uh, but killed a lot of people. Um, and if you want to put any sort of onus on the president, then you can say, yes, he killed a lot of people by his actions. But that's the same, you know, okay, then go back to Bush, go back to, you know, Clinton. Well, Clinton, we had a surplus, you know, at least you know, back, like, oh, my God, can you imagine a budget surplus these days? It'd be insane. <laughs> but it's like, eh, but and somehow Clinton gets a pass for all of his philandering that, that he did uh, because it's like, well, you know, back then we Democrats cared about the economy. And so that was what we were focused on. And well, it's just ridiculous. And the argument was so ridiculous too, right? And I remember being in a college political science class in my freshman, you know, my, my first freshman class. And I was already very much, and they were like, you know, the, the teacher, you know, some, you know, bull dyke lesbian, right? And she was like, what damn difference does it make? Who cares who, you know, he's getting blowjobs from? And, you know, I was like, do you think maybe ha being politically compromised and having secrets, you know, where people know some things might actually... Be a hindrance. I hope, you know, I hope, you know, today that lady's out there going, yeah, you know what, maybe the whole thing with Epstein, you know, where Clinton's sitting there in a blue dress with his, you know, red shoes on, you know, pointing at the, you know, whoever the, the painter is for this. And you're going like, man, yeah, I, you know, being vindicated 20 plus years later is one of those things where, you know, it, it's, it doesn't help you, but you're sitting there going, all of these guys, every single one of them has been you know, I say every, most every one of them has been compromised in some fashion, you know, just like Bill Clinton. And, you know, when I'll tell you, I think one of the reasons why they run the the porn sites and everything else out there is because they can track IP addresses. They can see what everybody's into. They can, you know, put, you know, special offerings like honey pots in, in places where they, you know, strategically need to control people. And now, you know, who's gay, you know, who's straight, you know, what their kinks are, you know, how they can be blackmailed. And before you know it, you've got secrets and compromised, you know, politicians and officers everywhere, especially in the U S government. And, Everybody's going like, well, yeah, obviously this is why we're funding this and this is why we're funding that. And it's just so blatantly obvious to see now. Um, yeah, this this federal government that we have here in the United States. Oh, man, um, it is going to be a very, very rough landing, I think, for those guys, for sure. And, and, and rightly so, you know, and, and rightly so. Yeah, I mean, well, they it, it, it always seems just incredible that more of them aren't found out which lets you know how strong that apparatus of control really is yeah like, like it, it's it's pretty crazy that okay Jill, you know Ghislaine maxwell got whatever 20 years or something for for child sex trafficking like 
guys, we're not talking about like, oh, you know, she, she smoked some pot once. It's like, nope, nope. She was a really, really horrible person really, and should, I think, should have gotten a hell of a lot more than that for what she did. But, you know, besides that, well, you know, Epstein killed himself. And I guess, well, you know, that's just, let's wash our hands of it. Let's not look any, you know, too deeply into this. And then, you, so I think the longer that stuff like that stays buried, the more people, though, start to wake up. Because they start to say, well, this is just, this is just so ridiculous. How can they be doing this? And that's one of those things I think a lot of people have points. They have different ways that their eyes are opened to how things really work. And we're all, you know, nobody understands the totality of everything, right? That's just impossible. You know, it's, you, you can't do it. But you understand more and more and your eyes open wider and wider. And sometimes you wish they hadn't been open so wide. Uh, but, but they are. And once they're open, you can't close them. And I think that different people get to that stage of opening their eyes through different, different experiences, different realizations, where they say, well, if this is this fucked up and broken, what else is this way? And I think that's how a lot of Bitcoiners have gone down many rabbit holes as you know tangential paths to Bitcoin, because they realized, mm -hmm. well, if the money itself is this broken, and if the incentives because of that broken money are this broken, well, that means that this corruption, this disease is just, it's metastasized through everything. And that realization is when you're like, oh, none of these political solutions, these short-term band-aids that the politicians talk about, none of them actually matter. They're just trying to score points for the next election cycle. And none of it matters unless we fix the base layer problem. And I think that at least, uh, you know, all that we've previously said about federal elections aside, at least the Overton window is shifting very strongly and, and rapidly to include Bitcoin in the discourse, mm -hmm. in the presidential election discourse. And that's a pretty powerful thing. Regardless of who wins, Bitcoin is now a top level, you know, ballot box issue. And yeah. that that's that's an incredible thing to see. Yeah, when, when you've got uh, when you've got a uh, a money that has no centralization, and it's making the well, the most popular politicians in the world not only stand up and notice, but offer it up as a political promise during campaign season. You know, hats off to Angela McArdle um, over at the LP. Uh, she's she's you know the the chair of the LP right now. And the fact that she got both Kennedy and Trump to, to come to an LP convention, get up on stage, talk about Bitcoin and your right to self-custody Bitcoin. Absolutely amazing. On top of that, um, you, you start to see, I think Trump's starting to take lightning um, uh, payments for his campaign uh, contributions, which unbelievable that that's happening. And, you know, for me, the icing on the cake was talking about Ross Ulbricht. And, you know, mentioning that he would pardon or commute um, Ross's sentence. So the fact that we have Donald Trump out there saying these things, I, you know, am I going to pay the price of admission and, and pull the lever for the guy? Probably not. But I'm a lot but closer. He's saying it. Yeah. But the fact that he is saying this now on, you know, international podcast basically you know and, and that's the thing legacy media can't hold the candles to what we're doing here in the podcast space now the internet is buzzing absolutely you know it, it's changed the face of our trajectory and you know let's just say you know for for all intents and purposes that donald trump wins the election in november the amount of pressure for bitcoin to be a reserve asset for the United States is going to be so incredibly huge. And whoever he's got whispering in his ear, I hope it's Vivek, if, if I'm being honest, um, about Bitcoin and, you know, some of the guys over at Bitcoin Magazine, um, you know, I know he's got a few of those guys whispering in his ear and telling him, you know, this is what you need to be looking at. This is what you need to be saying. You know, hats off to those guys, too, because the, the, the fact that they've got Donald Trump doing a 180 degree turn from just a couple of years ago where he's like, you know, I want the dollar and, you know, the dollar's got to be, you know, this and we're not going to talk about Bitcoin to now he's taking lightning payments. This is the biggest shift in all of Bitcoin probably ever. And most people are, you know, like checked out because we're not, you know, at a new all time high, which 
for, yeah. for me is like, I don't know. I, I see it a little bit differently, I guess. And um, the more you know, these guys lean into it, the more press it's going to have, the more, you know, the, the, the energy that's going to come into this from just the MAGA crowd alone. Like, this is one of the greatest things that MAGA could do is go out there and adopt Bitcoin and figure it out long before the communists, you know, the, you know, the, the people who are fascists and communists and that are pushing, you know, this trans, you know, ridiculous agenda, you know, down the throats of everybody. It's just, it's, it's just wrapped up, you know, you know, colorful communism now. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> if they can, if that crowd can adopt Bitcoin before everybody else, the amount of pressure and good cultural correction that we can do. Uh, there, there's no telling, you know, how far we can go with it. Well, and it's one of the back to, you know, the old meme, uh, you know, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. Yeah. And I think that that, that is tr really rings true. And I, I genuinely, I, I truly hope that Trump is being honest and serious when he talks about pardoning Ross. Um, and that if he is elected, he does do that on day one. Because I know his administration looked at it at the end of, or at least there were, were reports from insiders that they were looking at it at the end of his term, you know, because presidents always do pardons, a bunch of extra ones towards the end. And Ross didn't get that pardon. And so, I mean, that he, God, he deserves to be free. Yeah. And I truly, I truly hope that Trump keeps his word if he is elected. I, I think the best power move that Biden could do would be to just go ahead and proactively pardon Ross. Uh, yeah. that, you know, t take the wind right out of Trump's sails. I, I, I also, uh, I think that the best thing Biden could do would also be to drop all the charges against Julian Assange, who was indicted under Trump's DOJ under the Espionage Act, because that's another thing where I'm like, man, I, I want to believe that you, uh, you are pro freedom. But when I see your department of justice indicting a journalist under 17 counts of the Espionage Act and ruining his life for being, uh, for publishing award-winning journalism that just makes me sick yeah. and so i i would love to see a a commit uh, a firm committal for trump to also say i'm gonna pardon julian assange and make a public apology for what was done under my administration to him because i mean we go back to obama not even obama indicted assange because his doj thought that that was pretty tenuous to do that constitutionally so mm -hmm. that i that, that's it's a sticking point for me because again I, I agree with everything you said. The Overton window is shifting. That is a it is a great thing, and it honestly at this point it does not matter who wins from that perspective. Bitcoin wins either way. Everything's good for Bitcoin. It's in the public discourse. We know the Biden administration is not friendly toward it, uh, but that's going to come back to bite him in the ass because this is a incredibly motivated Bitcoiners are tenacious. They will. They are a a. a Frickin', uh, you know, honey badger with a bone. Like they will go after stuff. And if you come after Bitcoin, Bitcoiners will come after you. And I think that people are starting to realize that. And we'll do it in a peaceful way. We'll do it with memes and we'll do it with money and we'll do it with the force of our, you know, voices versus trying to violently coerce you to do it. Just in case there's any feds listening. Uh, we are the, <laughs> we're, we're totally peaceful people. Yeah, B Bitcoin is a peaceful and and legal and ethical and moral insurrection, uh, and against the monetary orders. We again for the, any of the feds, we are not uh, trying to foment insurrection here. Just want to get that on uh, get that on record because you know never know what spooks are listening these days. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No, and, and and to your point, um, I I don't believe that. Trump will do any of these things uh, in my heart of hearts. I, I think Trump is one of them. I don't think you get to be a billionaire without being one of them. I do think he may be smart enough to see the writing on the wall, though. And if he sees the writing on the wall and he's trying to just save his own skin, then the best thing you can do is do what's best for the people that are going to be powerful when it does collapse. And if if that's if that's his political play, then you know what? Let's milk the shit out of it. Let's let's take it yeah. for everything we can. Hey, you want to you want to be part of this crowd when everything comes crumbling down? And so that you know the the masses when they come for their flesh, you know their pound of flesh. It's like they're not coming for you. Then yeah, hey, you know what? Let's let's go as far as we absolutely can with this. 
but yeah, not for a second do I think he is, uh, you know, part of us. But yeah, I'll, I'll use him for everything that we can um, to to further the you know advancement of liberty for sure. Uh, amen to that. Um, it's it's we we can be the users versus the used for once. Uh, <laughs> you know, turn yeah, the I'll tables. Take it. Yeah, why not? You know, it, it's a uh, it's interesting. I'm I'm curious of your thoughts. You know, because we talk about the collapse of of empires, right? We talk about you know late stage empire, you know Rome 2.0 vibes. Uh, with with America, one thing I struggle with when uh, because I I'm in agreement with with you on that. But one thing that I struggle with is looking at the United States of America in in isolation in a vacuum because of course it's not. It, this is a a globally connected and now you know multipolar dynamic that we have. Mm-hmm. And you know I forget who said this to me a while ago, but they were like, yeah, you know, like the U.S. dollar is the worst except for all the rest. Like, yeah, the United <laughs> States is the worst. Well, except for all the rest. Like, it may be bad, but at the end of the day, we're still the most powerful nation with the strongest fiat currency in the world. So yeah. I have to wonder, when the dominoes start falling, when things start really collapsing, when we're in late, late stage empire, is it that the United States is actually that last domino to fall? Or or is it the first? You know, it, is it somewhere in the middle? Like, what does you know, do you know what I mean? What does that actually look like? Because, yeah, we can talk about how things are going to shit in America, but the reality is that odds are things may go to shit in a lot more places long before America does, because we've gotten really good at using our monetary system as a weapon yeah. and making sure we can retain some semblance of stability here and export all that instability with all the inflation and everything else. So I, I'd love your take on what that actually looks like when it shakes out. Yeah, I mean, looking at this adversarially um, and, and knowing what I know about, um, you know, the the state's MO in terms of prepping and then going to war, um, you know, obviously – a lot of people think that war is commenced with, you know, kinetic action, and it's obviously not. Uh, war is commenced a lot of times economically, uh, first and foremost, by destroying trust in institutions. Uh, you know, look look no further than uh, you know where we're at right now. We've we we literally have no trust in anything anymore, um, and you know that's you know another amazing you know point in Bitcoin is it's I think that will be the trust that we need to have in each other for, for rebuilding. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't think the, the U S is the first to fall. Um, and I, and I say that because we, I, I've had so many people, you know, you know, especially from Europe, Hey, in, in Australia, you guys have got all the damn guns. What are you waiting on? Right. And one of the things that I was kind of really pushing back in 2020 was, was peace. Um, I, you know, I, I, I grabbed a bunch of guys, you know, some, some, some boogaloo boys and we went down, we had a protest in April for the closing of everybody's lives and we were peaceful about it. We notified the sheriff and everything that was happening, but you know, it was one of those things where, Hey, listen, um, we do have all the guns and in that we are extremely powerful and power doesn't need to run its mouth. Power doesn't need to, you know, flex through violence power doesn't need to do any of those things power can be very very quiet and calm until it absolutely doesn't have to be or until it's forced to move um and we haven't been forced to move at all you know we we've you know there are people that are getting more and more uncomfortable but i don't see legions of americans with their rifles from appalachian stand you know making a a move to supplant this you know very wicked government um so i think because we have the guns and i think because we have the most powerful shitty currency in the world um we're probably going to suffer through this as long as we can I, I, and i really i hope we do because it's it, it's like um it's like a spring you know if, if you've ever done any you know manual labor on garage doors the spring that counteracts the weight of the garage door that thing is wound incredibly tight and if you were to just unleash that spring take your fingers off maybe your head things like that same thing with the government you just allow a government to automatically unravel as fast as it can under all the pressure that it's under it's going to kill a, a ton of people millions and millions and millions so the longer we can go and unwind all the kinetic pressure in that spring 
hopefully, you know, we get out of this with just a little bit of violence. Uh, and, and I mean, I don't want the violence. Don't get me wrong. If we get out of this without violence, but that's, that's just not what history teaches. Um, you know, history shows us that when empires fall, there's going to be this old guard that's clawing for power that will use as much force and coercion as it can to sustain its life because the only thing they have to offer the world is debt and death. And when we are now those people that are, are trusted with this new parallel economy because of the money that we are adopting, whether, you know, I think we're probably moving into a gold and Bitcoin part of our, our, our history for, for hard assets, but eventually, you know, gold will be replaced because they'll figure out you can't do, you know, uh, remittance on a global level for a global economy without it. And gold's going to continue to get cheaper. So I, I, with the Bitcoin standard anyway. And so as we move down, I, th I think we probably will see some violence, especially in cities. Uh, if you're in a densely populated area, I highly suggest to you, now is the time to probably not be in a highly, you know, populated area. Get away from that if, it, if you can. Um, and if you can't start making preparations to withstand it, wh whatever that looks like. So, um, yeah, I, I do see some violence on the horizon, unfortunately, but I don't, I don't think it's going to be as bad as it could have been or would have been had it not been for the, you know, the, the invention of Bitcoin. But yeah, um, I think Europe is going to have a very hard time. Um, I think Africa, uh, and South America are actually going to be some of the best places in, in the world because you, you're, you're starting to see what's happening with Bukele, um, Brazil, you know, with Miley down there and not that I trust Miley either, but you know, because they're already moving and taking steps in those directions and they are, they have nothing but to gain already. Whereas we have a lot to lose still. Um, I think those places are going to be bastions of where humanity is heading, whereas a lot of the old world places are going to have to figure some things out because of this aging population that wants to drag us in to paying for, you know, their retirements when it was all propped up on, you know, empty promises and, you know, ridiculous dreams of socialism and communism. <laughs> Uh, but socialism and communism, maybe they'll work this time if we just do them right. You know? Yeah, we just got to do it right this time. Just, just, just with a few more people dying this time. Or maybe it's going a few really, less, I don't know. really well yeah, right now. Going super well. No, I, I think that's a great point about, uh, about the global south. I mean, you look at Malay and Argentina. You look at Bukele and El Salvador. I, I just talked with uh, Maya Parbo, and she's running for president in Suriname uh, in this yeah. next year. There are uh, – and she is – extreme she is a bitcoiner first and a politician second uh to quote her um which i, I think it probably describes you as well uh you yeah, know i don't even say I, I, hey. god state I, I hate to even say statesman for god's sake so it's just a guy that's you know was fed up enough to say yeah you know what i think i'll kick these guys in the nuts for a political cycle and you know have my way uh, you know i i love it but you know th this is this new kind of vanguard of of leaders who are willing to engage politically and even somebody like yourself who yeah you were you were unsuccessful in terms of winning the elections but that doesn't mean that it was a futile endeavor because again every one of these conver that that debate that you had with, with two other with a republican and a democrat that shifts the overton window for people in georgia and for people all over the world who saw that debate went you know was pretty widely shared all around yeah. All of these conversations and then all of these actions by people who do make it into office by Bukele, the world is now looking and saying, oh, you locked up all these people. Uh, you know, we were told by the New York Times this was really bad and, uh, and, and a terrible thing. But now you're one of the safest countries in the world um, after being like the or if not the most dangerous, like right up there at the top, like you have turned around a country and given people hope. Yeah. Malay, we're starting to see some of the the benefits of you know his him taking a chainsaw uh, to to that government down there, which has been just absolutely uh, had their oh. blood vampirically sucked by just socialists for decades and decades. But you start to see a glimmer of hope, and at a certain point, people are not going to believe the bullshit that you feed them. 
They're going to believe the proof that they see with their eyes and that they hear with their ears. And you can only, you know, your propaganda only goes so far when you start realizing that, ah, this is all just full of shit. But, I, but I'm seeing examples of people doing the exact opposite of what I'm being told is good. And, and their countries are getting better. And mine seems to be getting worse. So what's happening here? And so th that gives me a lot of hope. And I think kind of the, to your point about gold uh, ver and Bitcoin as kind of a, you know, bi-metallic, you know, bi if you will, uh, you know, maybe standard for sovereigns moving forward. I think that's a very reasonable position. I, I saw, and I didn't, it was just before we got on here, I didn't have a chance to dig into it, but uh, that the uh, the petrodollar contract uh, for Saudi Arabia is actually expiring. Right? Like, yeah. Which I did not, which makes sense, you know, 74, 50 years uh, from 74. So things could get really interesting really, really fast. You know, I mean, they don't have the luxury of having a, uh, a contract in perpetuity like the United States Federal Reserve. We, we should all be so lucky to have a contract that literally goes on for infinity like the money printers in the U.S. But I think that they're the last kind of the pinnacle of the fiat pushback that we're going to see is CBDCs because this is, it's the ultimate embodiment of fiat, right? Mm -hmm. It's fiat in the sense that it's a, it's a fiat currency, but it's also confiscation by fiat now at, at the click of a button. It's, it's cutting you out of the financial system by fiat like that. It is by fiat surveilling everything you do, everyone you interact with. And it's also probably the most anti-American thing I have ever heard of. And I'm glad that I think we're seeing some pushback against this from, from some folks, uh, not from, not from all certainly, but I, I'd, I'd love to get your take on how you see the CBDC fight. Cause I, I do think it is a fight again, against something that is wholly un-American and anti-freedom. Uh, but this is a fight that's going to be fought all over the world. We've got 90 plus pilots of CBDCs going on all around, many of which have gone live. You see in places like Nigeria, people are rejecting it. They're, yeah. they're, you know, and you see that, and then you see the government start to crack down. So I'm curious how you see this part of the, the late stage empire's last grasping attempt at, at totalitarianism going down. And, and do you think it's, you know, is there a, is there a scenario you see where, where, you know what, uh, Bitcoin fails and maybe gold well gold already failed uh if, you know, if, if, if <laughs> gold, gold didn't fail if, if gold didn't fail we wouldn't be having this conversation here today about <laughs> about bitcoin um yeah but is there is there a failure case that you see for that where cbdc's do become the norm and and where bitcoin fails or what, what, what's what's your read I, I i don't um as soon as the uh sec approved because of the the court mandate right like hey you guys should probably get on this and go ahead and approve the etf not that i'm a, a big fan of the etfs but it's just another step on this continuum that we're moving down um the you know, the, the beautiful thing about uh cbdc's is they are less desirable than schedule one narcotics were for the united states and i'll i'll, I'll, I'll explain what i mean by that um you know back in you know i, I think it was what the late 90s early 2000s sometime is when colorado and california started to challenge the federal uh you know ruling on on, on drugs, right? Or I should say, at least the the executive orders on drugs. So you know, we we never pass an amendment to uh, to prohibit uh, people from from cannabis. You know, like we did with alcohol here in the United States. And so Colorado comes out, starts swinging, says, "Hey, you know what? Your your Schedule One laws are are bullshit." And California follows suit. Oregon, Washington start to follow suit. Now most of the damn country has followed suit minus Georgia down here. Um, but you know, for, for the most part, states have stood up and said, Hey, you know what? We actually think this is a plant that's natural and our, our people should have access to it. Well, in that same vein, CBDCs are even less popular than schedule one drugs. If you start looking at how unpopular the CBDCs have been, uh, in, in places like Nigeria and, you know, throughout other African countries and, um, in, in the test pilot programs, it, and now we see what China's become. You're sitting there going, like, this obviously cannot happen, right? Um, 
now try to apply that to a nation full of people that understand how bad CBDCs are, even without Bitcoin knowledge. And I will tell you, I get to talk to these people on a daily basis. And they're like, man, no way on earth I'm allowing my my retirement to be held in CBDCs. I'm, ne- I'm never going to do it. Whatever I have to do to get out of that, I'm going to get out of it. Um, I, I think states, you know, and we've already started to see, I think uh, Florida's uh, already outlawed CBDCs. I think there is what Oklahoma did it maybe just recently. Uh, there, it was on more dockets this year than it's ever been on. I think you're going to continue, continue to see more states, at least in the United States, say, hey, listen, we're not ever going to allow a CBDC here, not from the state, not from the feds. And, and, and that, that consensus is going to continue to grow. So I don't think there's a lot of worry there. Could somebody come out with an executive order and try to go that route? They could if they were a complete moron. Um, and you know, let's not put it past our complete moron politicians. <laughs> Uh, but, yeah, you, you never know. <laughs> yeah, so I, I actually have a, a pretty rosy outlook on the adoption of CBDCs, um, and and I should or say the, the lack of adoption on CBDCs. I'm, I, I don't think that they have the willpower. And every day that goes by, and every election cycle that goes by, we have a much better chance of having people who are in positions of power say, "Yeah, this is this is not going to fly under me." I, I I'm of the same opinion, and but again, you know, never never <laughs> underestimate a politician to do something really fucking stupid. That's right. Uh, but, you know, I, and and I think that the reason that you see such a actually uh, a strong pushback against this from people who, as you correctly pointed out, may have really no understanding of Bitcoin and are not coming at it from that angle, but you see a CBDC, and I think that people innately feel that freedom to transact is important. In fact, it, you can make the argument that it's the most important. If you don't have freedom to transact, yeah, okay, you can say, well, you have freedom of speech. Well, do you if you can't uh if you can't, you know, buy a a cell phone plan, if you can't uh, purchase a computer, if you've been locked out of the financial system, how easy is it for you to speak at scale? Freedom of religion? Are, are you able to buy a buy a plot of land for a church. No, you've been, you've been blacklisted for making those transactions. You can't do that. Can you organize? That gets really hard. You know, uh, freedom of the press, like good, again, good luck funding uh, any sort of independent news without access to the financial system. So it's such a foundational freedom. And, you know, I was, I was talking uh, with, with Max Hillebrand, who's a, just a fascinating guy uh, a few weeks ago. And he said something that that stuck with me, and this is in a more general freedom sense, but he said, as as freedom increases, morality increases. And as freedom decreases, morality decreases. And I hadn't thought about it from that perspective before, but it really kind of was like a, whoa, aha moment where I realized, well, that that really explains so much of the just, you know, general degeneracy that you see in societies, as they become less free, as they become more totalitarian and tyrannical, you see morality go down as well, because, you know, it's just, it, it's, it, they're functions of each other. And, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to be conscious of your time here. And, and I, I got a, a couple more things I want to dig into you, with you, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, it's easy to get sucked into kind of the, the black pill, for a lot of people, I think, you know, and, and God, everything's so fucked. Like, we're at, you, know, you know, yeah, you know, and here we are saying, you know, like, yeah, the presidential election doesn't matter. They're just going to keep printing and bombing and, and doing whatever else. But, but there are a lot of reasons to be hopeful and, you know, uh, to, to hope that and know that freedom will increase. So I'd love to know just from your perspective, uh, what, what is kind of the white pill for you? What is, what, what makes you hopeful that freedom is going to win in the end and, and, you know, allows you to keep getting up in the morning and say, I'm going to keep fighting for this. Boy. Um, one, one of my favorite pieces of Bitcoin, uh, layer zero, um, is, is, is the people, you know, all this talk about code and, you know, disruption and efficiency and scarcity and transparency and innovation and independence and, you know, all of these things that, you know, are the, are the principles and hallmarks of Bitcoin don't talk about the people and the people are the biggest element. You know, Bitcoin doesn't matter if it's not for people. And when, when you look at what's going on in this world right now, what I see is people 
on a daily basis making giant wins. You know, j- just the, the just the ability to expose people to real things on on Twitter or X or whatever they're calling it these days. I think that is a giant win for for humankind. And you know, when I see the innovation that's being poured into what we're doing, especially in, in Bitcoin, but you know, there's there's things outside of this. But just the 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 crowd we're gathering you're talking about some of the brightest people on earth with incredible work ethics that have you know like you know for instance you know Corey Clipson Corey Clipson's helped you know found like over 70 different small companies that's an incredible achievement you know just you've helped 70 entrepreneurs possibly get off the ground and create set, you know, maybe successful business or at least giving them the opportunity to see, to see that being poured back into this. And I see it, you know, with Bitcoin veterans, we have, you know, within a year, we've grown this platform to be, you know, an absolutely unruly decentralized group of dudes that are peaceful first and foremost that have this giant chip on their shoulder to to establish the dream that we were told about that was perverted and clean it up and you know when you start to see these forces coming together from the tech industry from the veterans industry from you know the the marketing from the sales from you know all you know maybe even taking pay cuts to come work on this mission and say this is bigger than me. This is bigger than you. This is about our legacy. We're starting to talk about legacy again. Like when? When is the last time that mainstream media was talking about you know legacy for our kids? They they don't. They they never ever talk about how how are we leaving the world and our children in a better position than when we found it. So we're not going to, like, I think our generation is looking at this going, no, we're going to make sure the kids are okay. We're going to make sure that they're extremely well-funded and extremely well-armed and dangerous as hell, but extremely peaceful people who want to build, not destroy, but build something that will be, you know, I don't say everlasting, but it was going to last for, you know, 2000 years, hopefully, um, I, I I just see so many aspects of this. I see you know people making speeches like yeah. I think you alluded uh, to this you know idea of you know the the, the right to I- interact with whoever you want, the right of association. Natalie Smolensky, you know people like that in this movement who go out into D.C. into the lion's den and deliver a message that is as American as apple pie, and then you know talk about how Bitcoin helps us get there. This you and me type of idea, not the third party, not somebody reaching in, you know, the hell with those people. We like, we're going to do this and we're going to do it no matter what the odds are. And so I think when, when I see that and I understand who's involved in this, I look at it and I go, yeah, there's a ton of work to do, but these people, they get a ton of work done before noon. You know, these people are the people that rise and grind at like 4 a.m. like a bunch of psychopaths. They ride, you know, the, the, the Bitcoin, um, you know, dark winter into, you know, this this haven where they're like, dude, have you seen it today? It's at 15000 Buy as much as you can. Go remortgage your home. Sell your cars. You know, possibly take out some loans. Whatever you need to do, however you need to acquire it, buy more of it while it's extremely cheap. And to see, you know, the brain power, the work ethic, the just the absolute grit that is, you know, surfacing right now. Oh boy, I'll tell you what, you want you need a white pill. You know, come come meet these people, get involved, start working alongside of them if you can keep up. And I will tell you right now, the the white pills are plentiful and they are really amazing because what you find in each and every one of these people who've found their passion is something that I think we've all been innately in, you know, enshrined with by our creator. And that is something that I think they don't want anybody talking about. And it's winning. That's, that to me is, is the bigger piece is this whole thing is bigger than money. It's bigger than people. It is, you know, it's, it's spiritual, it's educational. It is, it, it, it transcends 
every piece of our life. And I can't imagine a, a greater group of people to help lead uh, the rest of the world into a much brighter future. That's a hell of a white pill if I've ever heard one. Uh, <laughs> that, here, here. You know, I, I wanted to ask you too, um, and because I think you you started to touch on a little bit with the work you've done in Bitcoin veterans, but uh, the the brave experience is that what it's uh, called? I, I was. I, just looking into that a little bit. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Like yeah, what that is? And I, I'd love to, yeah, dive into that a little bit. This has been such an education for me. Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't one of those people that, uh, I, I, well, let's just say I grew up in the eighties in the South. Um, it was, you know, Ronald Reagan, Nancy Reagan and dare programs and everything else were like drugs will kill you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was very straight laced. I believed everything that they said. And, um, let's just say uh, a lot of it was a lie. I, I found out that Johns Hopkins was doing some research with psilocybin and I had, had also found cannabis probably around 2015. You know, I, I, as, as a Marine, I had my fair share of alcohol and I got to tell you, it's one of those things that, um, is very destructive. And you know, it, it, I was, I was not that guy. I wasn't, you know, the guy that would get blackout drunk or any of that kind of stuff. Um, especially as an adult and especially with kids, but I found that cannabis was one of those things that not only helped me sleep, but it was something that was completely foreign in terms of the way everybody had described it to me. And it made me a more patient person. It made me a little more, uh, empathetic and gave me some, some personality back. And so as I was Getting into uh, jujitsu, I, I was uh, befriended uh, by you know a guy that I will just call sh shaman esque, right? Like they hate being called shamans, you know. But let's let's face it, this guy was a shaman, and we started talking about some things, and he offered me a experience, and that was with psilocybin. We happened to have an extremely amazing natural area out here, um, about two thousand acres on a mountain that is just as pristine as it was 10,000 years ago. And it is beautiful. So to go into this environment, not really understanding what to expect. And, you know, to, you know, I've, I've had experience with alcohol. I've had experience with cannabis. And that was really about my, my limit in terms of, you know, drug culture or any of that kind of stuff. And so, you know, uh, at two and a half grams of, uh, psilocybin, I went in for the first time and had just the most beautiful experience. And as I, went through this, you know, my, my shaman is teaching me about the, the way, right? Like there is a way. And I was like, wow, man, like you, you, you don't seem like a, you know, a weird person at all. You seem more connected and spiritually aligned and passionate than most people that I know that go to church every week. And so we, uh, we, we continued, um, down this path to the point where he's like, you're, you're good to go. Like you, you know what you like, you know, where you're at, you know, what your dosage is, you know, how to, um, you know, to really give it everything that it respects. And so I went out one morning, um, by myself and listen, I disclaimer, this is not for everybody. Um, this is for people who have, uh, a, a really good handle on, everything that are in safe positions. And I don't even recommend this to most people, uh, especially what I did. I took about eight grams and went out to the forest wow. at about four o'clock in the morning by myself before the, the sun came up and had one of the most impactful experiences of my entire life. You know, you know, people will tell you their top five. I will tell you this is in my top five because it changed my perspective of where I fit in the cosmos. And when you can do that and you can zoom way out and at the same time, see the tiniest little details right in front of you about how the world works just at a, at a biological, you know, level and, and maybe even more of an energetic level. Uh, if you're looking at, you know, like quantum mechanics, you start to see the secrets of the universe and you start to go, wow, man, like we're actually all part of a consciousness. We are all part of this amazing consciousness that for whatever reason, we don't fully understand, but we're here to interact and we're here to provide something and we're here to help make sure that the species endures. And for me, 
at that same time, I was having this epiphany alongside of, you know, coming through, um, you know, the, the rabbit holes of Bitcoin going, oh my gosh, like we have such an opportunity here with everything that we're doing. Um, and these things are not mutually exclusive. Actually, they work very, very well together when, when you can have a populist go, Hey, listen, this is bigger than just me. Like this, this whole TikTok society that wants to their face all over everything. If you can sit there and go, well, what, what am I pouring myself into? What am I doing for the legacy that we talked about? What am I, what am I doing to make sure that the human species is going to be better off after my time on this planet? And it helped me through, you know, the, the post-traumatic stress I had. It helped me through, you know, it helped me to develop much more empathy for everybody, even people I couldn't stand. And I was like, this, it's, it was, it's all been a lie. You start to see everything untangled. But anyway, Brave gets into helping people who we identify become the best versions of themselves. And they're out there. And I mean, you look in this community and, you know, fortunately for us, there's been a lot of people who have already gone down, you know, this rabbit hole of psilocybin, um, and, and, and really looking at the, the world at a different, uh, time and space, so to speak. Whereas there are some who have not, who I have taken out and have shown these things to who are now energized and out there and doing, you know, their, the work that they know that they need to do. And so it's more or less a progression of here's introductory. Here is a major stepping off point, you know, two and a half grams, five grams. And then if, you know, if, if we're handling this okay and we're, we're being productive with it and, and doing what we need to do, um, then maybe let's talk about, you know, where you're going from here. And so what we're doing is basically setting up a, and I hate to use the word, let's just say it, let's just call it a community. We're setting up a community of men that are first and foremost, holding each other accountable. Secondly, they are enriching each other spiritually, uh, you know, mentally with, with the way they're communicating. They're, they're, they're enriching each other uh, through uh, the actions that they're taking in this world, you know, pushing each other uh, health-wise. They're, 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 they're trying to help each other become, you know, the, the best version of themselves possible, whether it's being a father, a dad, a husband, you know, a, a, somebody you work with, whatever those things are. You're trying to help somebody maximize the potential that they were given at birth on this planet so they can go out and help people from now until the end of time with their contribution to the human species. And I know that is very esoteric and large, but I've got to tell you, um, not only was you know Brave born out of this, but Bitcoin veterans, um, these this this whole thing is really a testament to man's man's relationship with a greater spiritual being and understanding that he is here to take care of his brothers and sisters rather than fight them um and and you know be this drain of you know constantly consuming resources on the, on the planet you, you're net positive and i got to tell you you know to be a part of that and to see how it's how it's really brought people and guys that I'm very you know close with into their own. It's it's absolutely amazing. And that's a it's a beautiful thing, and thank you for giving the background on that too. Uh, eight and a half grams is that is a that is a godly dose. It's a healthy um, dose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's like that's said, impressive. I don't recommend that for most people. You know, right. there, there are few people in a few places that can handle that kind of stuff. And a lot of them have a, a warrior's ethos, right? Like there, if you can be light and love in those moments, then there's something else out there that's calling you. I, I, I think it's incredible that you're doing this and that it's also come around, you know, kind of tangentially, but as a part of everything that you're doing with Bitcoin and, you know, it's, it also just makes me think like, it's so sad how many people could have been helped by these incredible plants that grow out of the ground, uh, that don't require, uh, any crazy processing for you to extract their benefits, uh, and that you can consume 
that can genuinely help so many people. But, uh, you know, not to bring it back to the fucking totalitarian state, but dear God, so much bullshit and regulation has prevented so many people from getting what could have been a saving grace for them, but they were instead pumped full of pharmaceuticals and other shit and made to be addicted. And it, not to, not to black pill it again after such a lovely, you know, white, white pill, but it just, I, I just can't help but, but think of that. And it, yeah. and it is amazing that now at least there's research being done too. And, you know, not that you need research to try something for yourself, but for a lot of people, it, it, it helps a lot. It's the thing that says, well, okay, if they're actually researching this for X, Y, and Z benefits, then, then there must be something to this. Maybe everything I've been told is not the gospel truth. Maybe, you know, in fact, shockingly, the government did not have my best interests at heart when it put me through all these, these programs. I never went through D.A.R.E. Uh, because I was homeschooled. So, and, you know, I, I missed out on all that, sadly. But I, I've, heard, I've heard wonderful things about the program uh, that it was obviously very effective. Uh, clearly, just look, <laughs> look, look around here, right? <laughs> Yeah. God. So, yeah, but, yeah, I, and that's the thing is, you know, once once you really see through everything uh, after one of these experiences, you go, "Wow, man! These uh, these power centers in the world, whether they're uh, you know uh, political or religious or economic, you know, they all agree that they don't want you thinking for yourself, and they definitely don't want you having this perspective of how you're going to do things uh, outside of the box and for you know a higher graceful power." Yeah, it's it's so true, and that, that that idea because so much of our society is focused, and so much of our political structure is focused on this dualism of us versus them, of you know we and the other, you know of I and you, and and you reach a certain point where you realize that all of that dualism is is just a facade, um, and that there is a, you know I, I'm not gonna sound a little shaman esque here, but that there is a oneness. Uh, like there, there, there is no us and them. Uh, we're all part of this and you cannot separate yourself from it. And once you realize that, uh, things start to make a lot more sense. And so much of the angst that there is out there is people not understanding that and instead falling into the trap of this dualism that they want to push because, you know, division works when it comes to keeping people suppressed and asleep. Um, but I think more people are waking up and it's incredible that you're taking this, uh, what some would probably call very radical, but what others would call incredibly natural, uh, way of showing people this. So I think that that's, that's incredible. And I appreciate you sharing that with me. I want to be conscious of your scarce time here, yep. but the, the yeah. last question I would have is just, uh, cause the, first of all, this has been an awesome discussion with you here today. I've enjoyed the hell out of it. You recommended um, you'll have to remind me of the author's name from earlier. Uh, but I'm also curious, is there anything else that you are reading that has really been influential for you either right now or something from, from your past that you would really recommend to folks? Yeah. Um, I would tell you, you know, as, as a dad, if you guys are out there and you're looking for the, that last push, um, John Taylor Gatto, I mentioned him earlier. Um, boy, if you need that last punch, uh, just to say, yeah, let's, we're going to do this homeschool thing. Um, read some John Taylor Gatto. I guarantee you, you and your wife will start making preparations and you'll just, you know, what you, you know, what you do, what you think about, what you, you focus on, you become, so you'll become homeschoolers. I guarantee you, uh, if, if you go down that path, um, you know, some of the, some of the other great things that I've read, uh, you know, let, let's, let's start with maybe something that a lot of people never read, um, Dr. Dennis Leary uh, out there, and I know this is kind of a surprise, he wrote a book back in the day called Why We Suck. And this was kind of back when I was still very star spangly, red, white, and blue, and glittery, and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to read this, and I'd like, I'm going to hate every second of it. And then I read it, and I was like, wow, he's right. Like, I, he, he was right. I was like, Maybe I need to, you know, take a step back from the, you know, this dose of whatever, you know, they're, they're, they're handing me right now and maybe pursue some other areas, right? It's okay to, to not love your government and, and not love all the bullshit that they're force feeding you and, you know, and really start to not 
be in the corner of any politician. And I think that's one of the most freeing things you can do. It, it was one of the first times I think I read that and I was like, you know what, I don't need to vote for any of these guys. And it was, you know, very, you know, when I walked out of the, the voting booth and I didn't cast, I think it was 2012 after um, Ron Paul was not allowed on the ballot. I didn't cast an, a, a vote for president in 2012. And I walked out of there going like, huh, good. And for the next four years, I didn't have to defend anybody. I didn't have to do any of those things. So it was very freeing. Um, if you can get, if you're interested in Austrian economics, you know, great. Uh, go out there and read everything Rothbard, uh, you know, or uh, Mises or Hayek and, you know, any of the Austrian greats. Read, read as much of that as possible. Um, they're, they're, boy, uh, in, in terms of, you know, some Bitcoin uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Brian DeMint. Brian's written some, you know, he has, I haven't read uh, parallel yet, but, uh, Bitcoin evangelism was great. Broken money by Lynn Alden. Fantastic book. I mean, you want to talk about just a, a huge voice in this community. And, you know, if you've got gr little girls, man, what a, what a, you know, between, I, I know I've mentioned her as well. Uh, Natalie Smolinski, Lisa yeah, uh, Huff, and you know some of these some of these ladies that are involved in Bitcoin. You want to talk about great people who are you know writing and producing uh, great content and can and, and are real uh, real mentors for little girls. I think it is a fantastic place. Uh, for for you guys out there, uh, The Way of Men is a great book, um, and it's I, I don't recommend the audio version. It's it's kind of hard to listen to, but the the book itself, in terms of the message, is uh, is absolutely fantastic. Like, don't don't think you know you need easy times on this on this earth, and that's kind of what he gets down to is you need you need a group of guys that holds you accountable. You need you need to struggle. You need to fight. You need, this is what you were born to do. Like the, in, innately in your DNA, this is what you were born to do as a man and doing it constructively while building society instead of tearing it down is, you know, what, what they talk about. So, uh, you know, I, I could probably go on and on about, you know, different books that have kind of given me little, uh, you know, feathers of wisdom and everything, but yeah, I'll probably leave it at that. There's and, and hats off to Safadin. Safadin, um, I think his greatest book and probably should have been prefaced with, excuse me, with, uh, the, the fiat standard in terms of identifying the problem with the world and how it's absolutely destroyed everything down to our soil. Like there's, there's not a better book. Um, and so if, if that's your premise, then it's, it's a very easy, uh, to understand why Bitcoin is, is a great solution for us. Yeah, well, that's a, it's a heck of a list. Um, and I, I, I would agree on those counts, uh, and, and looking forward to checking out the one. Was it John, John Taylor Goddick? Was that? John, uh, yeah, got, yeah. Gatto kind of like the how they spell oh, the cat in Spanish. Ah, but, okay. Uh, okay. Got it. Well, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that. And you know, Shane, again, I really appreciate your time here. Glad we got to chat. Uh, we could probably, we might have to do another one of these at some point because I, I think we could, uh, we, we could pick brains for hours here, yeah. but you know, our, our time is scarce. Uh, so I'll let you get back to the family, but unlike our time and unlike Bitcoin, Bitcoin podcasts are abundant. So thank you for coming on another fucking Bitcoin podcast. Uh, it's been a great time and looking forward to seeing you in the flesh here, hopefully soon. Yeah. Uh, Walker, this has been my pleasure to finally get down to, uh, to talking with you. I mean, best of you as a new dad. Um, you guys are, you. are doing it right, man. Great job on the podcast. And uh, I appreciate your time and, and, and the platform. Anybody that will give you a platform to come on and talk about ideas and, and what they're doing in this world. Um, hats off to you and, and everything you guys are up to. And, and, and I thank you very much. Amen to that. And that's a wrap on this Bitcoin Talk episode of The Bitcoin Podcast. If you're a Bitcoin-only company interested in sponsoring another fucking Bitcoin podcast, head to bitcoinpodcast.net slash sponsor. And if you're enjoying the Bitcoin podcast, consider giving a five-star review wherever you listen or sharing the show with your network. Or don't. Bitcoin doesn't care. You can find me on Noster by going to primal.net slash walker. And if you want to follow the Bitcoin podcast on Twitter, go to at Titcoin podcast and at Walker America. You can also find the video version of this show at youtube.com slash at Walker America and at Walker America on Rumble. 
Bitcoin is scarce. There will only ever be 21 million. But Bitcoin podcasts are abundant. So thank you for spending your scarce time to listen to another fucking Bitcoin podcast. Until next time, stay free.